No joke, if you have a proper understanding of NO3 nitrate and PO4 phosphate, you will be able to control dinoflagellates, cyanobacteria, coral growth, and coloration. Well, howdy, howdy to all of my fellow and future hobbyists out there. My name is Matthew, your BRS beginner guru, and this is episode 41, part B. This is part two of four, all about advanced water testing. If you missed episode 41, part A, check it out. We'll put a link below. We covered everything having to do with the nitrogen cycle, but today we are tackling the big topic of the relationship between nitrate and phosphate, how often to test, and more importantly, what those tests tell you about your tank. These are the two parameters most useful, most misunderstood, and most frustrating out of all the things we test for in our tank. Understanding nitrate and phosphate will help you tackle nuisance algae, cyanobacteria, dinoflagellates, skimmers, GFO, mechanical filtration, and coral coloration and growth. So here is the super simplified overview of these two. Nitrate or NO3 is a great fertilizer for macroalgae. It most commonly enters your aquarium through livestock food, fish food, and fish waste. If it's too high, it can fuel nuisance algae growth in your tank, but if it's too low, it can stunt coral growth. And if it really bottoms out, it can actually lead to a cyanobacteria and even worse, a dinoflagellate outbreak. Nitrate can really only be removed via water changes, robust anaerobic bacteria, and macroalgae. And as reefers, especially those of you who want to have corals in your tank, we typically recommend a range of anywhere between two and five parts per million. But honestly, if it's a little bit lower but still readable, you're probably okay. And I know plenty of hobbyists that don't worry unless their nitrates start approaching 30 parts per million. Phosphate or PO4 is another great algae fertilizer. And it's very similar in NO3 in the ways that it can be removed and in the things that it causes. Way too much phosphate is going to cause a lot of nuisance algae growth, and too little phosphate can stunt coral growth and lead to things like dinoflagellates and cyanobacteria. But we have one extra tool in our arsenal to remove phosphate, and that is GFO or granular ferric oxide. Let's talk first, before we get into our scenarios, about how to prevent NO3 and PO4. First up is a protein skimmer, but you need to understand something, and that is protein skimmers don't actually remove NO3 and PO4, but they can remove organics before those organics have a chance to break down and turn into NO3 and PO4. Another way of preventing NO3 and PO4 is to use a gravel vacuum to siphon out detritus in your substrate. Again, you're probably not removing much NO3 and PO4, but you're removing a whole bunch of organic material that won't have a chance to break down. The third way to prevent nitrate and phosphate is to switch from pellet foods to frozen foods. When you use pellet foods, you are five to 10 times more likely to overfeed, and that's because pellet foods are five to 10 times more nutrient dense by weight when compared to frozen foods. And the fourth way to prevent PO4 and NO3 from getting into your tank is just don't put in too many fish. So you have NO3 and PO4 in your tank, how do you remove it? Well, the following methods will reduce both nitrate and phosphate. First up, you got water changes. Second, macroalgae. That can be macroalgae in a refugium, in a hang on the back container, in a reactor, or in your display tank. And thirdly, a robust biological filter will remove nitrates and phosphates, but it's important to know that it will remove nitrates and phosphates in a ratio of 16 part nitrates to one part phosphates. So while it will work to remove nitrates, it really doesn't do much for phosphates. So we just covered the ways to remove nitrate and phosphates together, but what if you just have a nitrate problem? How do you lower that? And really we're talking about carbon dosing, sugar dosing, vodka dosing, and bio pellets, all of which are a form of carbon dosing. I don't wanna go into it here. I do not recommend these methods for beginners. I have tinkered with them in the past and they have sort of worked, but if you do it incorrectly, you can crash your tank. So forget I even mentioned it because there are easier ways and safer ways to reduce nitrate in your tank. Okay, so you don't have a nitrate problem, but you do have a phosphate problem. How can you just lower phosphate? This one's super easy. You use a product called GFO, 
or granular ferric oxide. You can use this in some sort of media bag or more commonly and more effectively, you can use this in a reactor. I'm not gonna go into details here, but just know if you do use GFO, you have to use it sparingly because if you use too much and bottom out your phosphate levels, that does often lead to cyanobacteria and dinoflagellate outbreaks, and it can also stunt your coral growth. All right, moving on to our scenarios. Scenario number one, nuisance algae is growing in your tank. Nuisance algae, especially the dreaded GHA or green hair algae, uses light, nitrates, and phosphates to grow. If you have nuisance algae growing in your tank, that likely means either your nitrates and phosphates are too high, or that you have your light on for too long, or it's too strong. If you test your NO3 and your PO4 frequently, like twice a week at least, you will likely see your nitrates and your phosphates slowly start to creep up before you get nuisance algae growth. But at some point, as those nitrates and phosphates creep up, the nuisance algae will take hold, and you might not notice it right away, but eventually your NO3 and your PO4, at least the NO3 and the PO4 that you're testing for, will slowly start to fall. Your test results will lull you into a false sense of security, and you'll think that somehow your nitrates and your phosphates are just magically disappearing from your tank. When in fact, what's probably happening is the nuisance algae, whether you see it or not, is growing rapidly and consuming the nitrates and phosphates in the water column. So you may think you have no nitrates and phosphates when in fact you have a lot of nitrates and phosphates that are just being consumed by the macroalgae. Then one day you'll start to notice patches of algae. So you'll get out your test kit and you'll test and you'll get zero nitrates and zero phosphate. And you'll sit there and you'll scratch your head and your brain will start to hurt. And the first thing you're probably gonna think is, well, my test kit must be bad. So you'll go and you'll get another test kit or you'll bring in a water sample to your local fish store. They'll test it, you'll spend more money and you'll get zeros, zeros again and you will have no idea what the problem is. But as long as your lights are set up correctly, and if you need a refresher, remember episodes 26, 27, and 28, we go into detail about how to set up your lights correctly, but if they are set up correctly, meaning the correct photo period and the correct PAR, then you have a nutrient problem. Even if your tests are reading zero nitrates and zero phosphates, trust me, you have a nitrate and phosphate problem. So while this video isn't about how to get rid of nuisance algae, you're gonna have to start by getting your nitrates and phosphates under control to starve out the nuisance algae. And scenario number two, when we're talking about nitrates and phosphates, is cyanobacteria and dinoflagellate outbreaks. These two things usually pop up when one of two things happens in your tank. The first is you just finally won the battle against nuisance algae, things seem to be settling in, and bam, one of the two appears out of nowhere once the nuisance algae disappears. Or you've never had nuisance algae, and in fact, you're terrified at getting nuisance algae, so you make sure to keep your nutrient levels, specifically your nitrates and your phosphates, as close to zero as possible. Beep, 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 beep. Then one day you notice a brown, mucusy, snotty looking algae with a little bubble at the tip causing it to stand upright pointing to your lights. Now where you were so proud of yourself for preventing nuisance algae growth, you have caused a much bigger problem, dinoflagellates. Here's the gist, we don't know exactly what causes cyanobacteria or dinoflagellates to grow in your tank. They're probably always there, but almost always kept at bay due to various circumstances. Over the past decade, hobbyists have started to anecdotally notice a few characteristics. They've seen that when your PO4 and your NO3 are at zero, you tend to have a higher chance of getting a cyanobacteria outbreak or a dinoflagellate outbreak. This has led many hobbyists to opine that when your nitrate and phosphate levels are too low, this gives cyanobacteria and dinoflagellate a greater chance to outcompete the beneficial bacteria in your tank, meaning that dinos and cyano are just better scavengers than the beneficial bacteria, so when there's just not enough there for anybody, cyano and dinos are gonna win. Moral of the story, test frequently, make sure your nitrates and your phosphates are always readable, never at zero. But we are gonna end that video right here and leave you on the edge of your seat waiting for the next episode. Or if you're watching this like a week later or two weeks or even a year later, 
then you just got to go to the next episode in the playlist. In part B, we're going to continue with our nitrate and our phosphate scenarios and testing tips, as well as tackle the complicated, and it is so complicated, the complicated relationship between calcium, alkalinity, pH, and magnesium. Links to my personal preferred test kits are in the description below. And as always, everybody, thanks for watching. Happy reefing. Be well. We'll see you next time.